objective is to inspire our partner marketing community to elevate their marketing practice, both from a personal leadership perspective, but also to leverage best practice, like how NTT has embraced the disruption caused by COVID-19. So to kick things off, Ruth, can you share a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Um, so I'm uh, the global CMO for NTT Limited, um, which means I'm accountable for all of marketing and communications around the world for all parts of the NTT Limited business. That's great. One of the things that I'm most impressed about your profile is your global experience uh, and how you've lived in Hong Kong for many years. What did you miss most about Asia? I've been incredibly fortunate in my career to, to, to do several different global roles and also several different regional roles, looking after um, the, the, U, the European region, uh, an asia Pac region. And actually, um, when I worked for an American company, a region that was deemed international, which at that point meant everything outside of North America. Um, and I think with that comes just the, the privilege of being able to work in different countries with different client groups and understand the nuances of different markets. Um, as part of uh, one of those roles, I had the, the privilege and the opportunity to live in Hong Kong for, for just over five years, which was just the most extraordinary learning opportunity for me, um, not just in a business sense, but also when you take yourself out of um, an environment that you're very comfortable with, that you've grown up with, to, to then being in, a, in an environment that is very unfamiliar, you know, the language that you hear, hear spoken around you, the food that you see in the supermarket, um, you know, the, the cultures of the of the people that, that you live next to, it's you just learn a huge amount, both about what challenging what you do know, but also for me, my big learning was actually realizing what I didn't even know I didn't know. Um, that kind of unconscious um, bias that we often talk about of the things that we're just not not aware of. Yeah, that's amazing. Hong Kong is one of my favorite cities. Um, so you're so lucky to have lived there. Uh, now, in the last 12 months, you've also been involved in driving one of the biggest brand transition in our industry. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and, and what an extraordinary time that was. And that was actually before before COVID. Um, so, yes, we um, in 2019 launched a new company uh, called NTT Limited. NTT is uh, one of Japan's oldest companies, over 120 years old, um, but uh, and and a, a, a very large uh, conglomerate which owns over a thousand different organisations. But in 2019, we brought together 31 of those international technology expert organisations to come together to better serve our clients around the world, um, and all under the NTT brand. So we worked pretty hard. Uh, for the 18 months before that to on that integration um, bringing those companies together um, I led the, the the marketing and communications element of that which was just fascinating when you get into principles of brand purpose vision you know a simple articulation of what the company does and particularly interesting with this integration was actually that relationship with the parent company and, and obviously that parent company being being Japanese and making that parent company very relevant um, in the global market. So we're still very much at the beginning of the journey of this new organization, um, this new brand in NTT and the opportunity to also introduce this organization, who we are, what makes us different to, to the world. Um, so we did all of that, thankfully, <laughs> in 2019, not knowing, obviously none of us knew that a global pandemic was around the corner. So the first year of this organization's life has just been extraordinarily interesting as obviously not only are we standing up a new company bringing 40,000 people from across 31 different organizations together um, but then pivoting and adapting the way everybody's had to do through 2020 to, to to the global pandemic yeah that's amazing and it's actually quite fortunate that a lot of this happened with covid uh, before covid right so since covid how have you been doing how have you and your team being an adapting to marketing uh, post the COVID world. Yeah, well, I think I think we've all been in in the same place, haven't we? You know, in in marketing teams around the world, in all companies and and all industries. Um, you know, very much at the heart of of how our organisations have had to adapt, and also just how as we as individuals have had to adapt to to how we work and live, um, and and hopefully stay healthy um, in, in this world. Um, so I mean, I guess if I wind back to to the beginning of 2020. You know, one of the things that NTT's um, 
very privileged to have very much like Cisco is we're a global company. We have organizations and operations in every country around the world. Um, and because of that, we could see at the very beginning of 2020, the impact of COVID-19 on Asia, you know, so it was like an early warning system. You know, we were hearing mm -hmm. from our, our organizations and, and operations in China um, and across the Asia region of, of what was happening. So it gave us really a, a, an insight as to what was coming um, into the European markets and then into the Americas um, uh, from, from the East. Um, so that enabled us to, to, to plan maybe a little bit earlier. But I think like most organizations, you know, we never planned. Everybody had disaster recovery plans and could put disaster recovery and processes in place. But most of us really didn't expect for a global pandemic. You know, there was always a disaster relief if you had to shut one global delivery center. And we have two main sites in the world. Each one is a backup to the other. But we never really expected that that both would need to, to, to be to, to be um, working in a virtual space. So really, our, our first priority at the beginning of the year was to make sure that all of, all of our employees were safe, you know, that everybody felt empowered to do the right thing um, for them. Um, and their families uh, in their situation. We had to get many people who'd never worked from home before into a home working environment. And you know, sometimes that was as simple as sourcing a laptop for that person to be able to, to, to work from home. And then obviously making sure that they had all of the systems access um, that, that they needed to be able to do their jobs effectively, but also safely from, from a home environment. Um, and I think for, for many of us, we learned so many things that you can't control necessarily as an employer or as an organization which would be you know having a space in the house that would be quiet um and, and people able to work from you know just the health and well-being of having a proper chair to sit on and in many countries actually just having good enough bandwidth at home to be able to connect to do everything um that you need to which is something i probably take for granted a little bit sitting here in london um but in many of our our, our countries you know just um, good enough bandwidth was, was an issue. So we had to solve many of those problems quite, quite quickly. And then our second priority was, was obviously making sure that we could deliver all of the services for our clients, making sure certainly as a marketing community that we were providing really clear communications and updates to, to our clients about what we were doing, you know, that we were reassure, reassuring our clients around continuity of service um, and being as transparent as possible about you know what was going on in our own organization and what that what what that meant for our clients and then i guess the the third element of that is then being able to respond to the changing needs of of our clients and very much like cisco you know we're incredibly fortunate to be in the technology industry which because of covid i think the whole world has lent on technology more so than ever before you know we're all increasingly using our devices and the connectivity that we have to, to live our lives and to, 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 to work. You know, we're sitting here doing this kind of discussion, not in a room, sat with a nice cup of coffee around a table, you know, we're on a Cisco WebEx bridge, um, um, run, you know, having this conversation. And I think, you know, all of us pretty much without exception in the world have turned to technology to be able to continue to live and to work, to play, to socialize, even to exercise. I mean, how many of us have done exercise classes on uh, on on um, on on virtual connections over the last six months. So um, our clients have also seen that same requirement. You know, just an increasing requirement on technology. And I think you know, as an industry, we talk about actually one of the positive outcomes of COVID is the acceleration of adoption of of the digital world um, and the increased movement to um, to 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 digitization um, around you know, both consumers as well as um, corporates. Um, so they're probably the three things that we really focused on, making sure our people were safe and, and, and able to work, making sure we were being really transparent with our clients about what was happening in our own organization uh, to reassure them. And, and then thirdly, to make sure we're responding to those increasing needs um, from our clients around the extra technology they needed to be able to, to, to respond and adapt in their organization. Yeah, that's so great to hear. And it's so amazing that it's so people centric, right? You really focus on your, your team first and then the needs of our customers and then kind of building out the, the need, the requirements and the solutions after that. Is there any success or best practices that your team has developed that you'd like to share with our audience? Oh, do you know, Boone, I, I'd love to say that we, we, we've had the time and the space to reflect back on this 
to create best practice. Um, um, I, I don't think we're there yet. I think we're still in the respond um, and just make sure that, um, you know, as we pivoted events into the digital space, as we pivoted all of our client engagement and, and listening into, into the digital space. Um, I think we've definitely got learnings. I, I, I'm not sure those learnings are quite best practice yet. Um, but I think one of our learnings has definitely been transparency. Um, you know, just being honest about where we are, uh, what we know, what we don't know, and where we have answers, you know, particularly internally, where we've had a lot of questions around how we're going to work in the future, when will we be back at the office, um, you know, when will this change, um, will we go back to normal, you know, I think we all hear that, that question a lot, um, and so often we, we don't know the answer to those questions. Um, but we often have a view uh, or, or we can be transparent about where we are right now um, and what's happening right now. Um, so I think transparency is something we've, we've really learned. Um, and I think mirroring that is a real sense of humbleness. Um, and I think one of one of the positives I see coming out of this global pandemic is nobody anywhere really had a blueprint for what to do in this situation. Um, because certainly in our generation, we've never experienced something like this. So. I think there's been a real movement to people asking each other for help, exactly like this conversation we're having of what did you learn and can you share that? Um, and I think we're all really beginning to learn more from each other between industries, between organisations, uh, and uh, and that's that's a great thing. Yeah, that's so, that's so important, and it's actually amazing to see how the industry has come together in a much more collaborative way particularly around marketers. Um, actually, you know, the last time we met was actually at the Tour de France uh, as part of, you know, the, the NTT sponsorship, but also the, the Cisco partnership. Can you share a little bit about how COVID has changed and shaped the sponsorship and how you guys have been activating it? <laughs> yes, very happy to. It was, uh, we, were, we were, I guess, fortunate um, that we made a decision very early on um, to activate in a very different way with the Tour de France. So like any of these big brand partnerships, which which many organizations have, um, you know, you have very clear um, strategic goals around why you enter into the partnership in, in the first place. So in February 2020, we, um, you know, and it wasn't because we knew, had any great foresight or projections about what was going to happen with the pandemic. But it was something as, as basic, as we were having to confirm venues and make deposit payments for venues for um, accommodation for our technical team at the July edition of the Tour de France, as well as for our client program. Um, and that was actually quite a significant amount of money. Um, and so at that point, there was so much uncertainty um, in the world around what was going to happen. We actually made a decision back in February to say, whatever happens, we won't have anybody on the ground in France at the Tour de France. And we normally have a, a fairly large technical team that are there delivering uh, the, the technical service that allow us to deliver all the technology that allows us to capture data from the bikes, that, uh, that analyzes and publishes that data in real time, that then tells stories with that data across social platforms, across digital platforms, and, and, and also with graphics that, that go onto the TV broadcast. So we decided that that team wouldn't be physically in France. And then we also made a decision that the marketing program would be activated fully virtually. So we created a phrase that we called the virtual Tour de France or, or the virtual zone technique, the virtual client program. And interestingly, actually, uh, later on in the year, the Tour de France itself decided they'd have a virtual Tour de France because the race was actually moved back two months um, um, and, and postponed two months. So um, we were probably one of the best decisions in hindsight we made was to make that decision very early. Um, and that gave us time to plan to both think about how do you fully virtualize a technical solution and deliver it with a team that are based all the way around the world. Um, and that team had the, 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 the time to prepare themselves physically uh, to not actually be on the ground in France, but to be working the, the hours of the, the race in France. And, and we had people all the way from Melbourne through um, Japan, South Africa, Europe, all the way to the rest coast of the States supporting this virtual solution um, in France. So working some very strange hours um, for, for three weeks whilst, whilst the race happened. And then we also uh, really pivoted the client engagement program and storytelling again to be delivered fully virtually. And I think all marketers, certainly in the B2B space, have moved 
what would have been physical engagement, still very important to many of us, pretty much wholeheartedly now in, into the digital space. And we used it as an opportunity to try lots of different platforms and types of events and ways of engaging digitally, small groups, large groups, interaction, no interaction, and really saw it as an opportunity for us to learn about what works, what doesn't work, um, what people enjoy, what they don't enjoy, as we told the story of um, virtualizing the Tour de France. So um, the Tour de has just finished. Um, it was also very odd for us to execute a, a Tour de France that happened in September rather than July. So it, this year it felt like our birthday moved. Um, you know, we realized that we got so used to being in France in July and then all of a sudden, hey, we weren't in France in July and then we were we were supporting the Tour in September. So that in itself felt weird. Um, so it's just finished and actually we're beginning to see some really positive results around all of those strategic goals that we'd normally have um, from, from just doing things differently. And we, we've just done the wrap up of this year's programme, actually. And, and one of the things do you think we all conclude is this has been obviously not an expected disruption. Actually, we see quite a positive disruption because it will force change um, into how we think about the programme, how we execute the programme. This is a long term partnership for us. Um, but it will force change in a good way. Uh, and actually, we think, obviously, nobody knows what 2021 will look like, um, but we'll definitely think differently about how we execute what we do um, in 2021, irrespective of where the world is. Yeah, that's such a great opportunity to learn and also to adapt, right, in such an agile way to the, the ever-changing environment. And it's great to have the learning from this year help build it out, as your, to your point, in a much more sustainable way. Um, so looking forward, what's your prediction of marketing in a post-COVID world? Yeah, I, I think, I, I think I, I'm, an, I'm an optimist. Um, so um, however bad things seem to be, I always believe they happen for a reason. Um, and that great, you know, good things come from, from all situations. And I, I really believe that for, for our marketing community um, through through this global pandemic. I think it's forced us to challenge the status quo, which is a great thing. Um, I think it's forced us to really go back to some of the basics of marketing principles, which is a great thing. I think it's forced us to really focus on our clients um, and what's important to them and having a more honest, not that I think we ever had a dishonest, um, but very trusting, transparent, honest relationship with, with our clients and forced us to get back to those principles about, well, who are we and what makes us different as an organization and the kind of partner that we are to our clients. Um, and I think that's a really healthy um, time to kind of pause, isn't it? And just go back to some of those basics. And so often, particularly you once you get into the rhythm of marketing execution, you know, we, we, we plan and we kind of think about well, what we do, what would we normally do? What would our year normally look like? Who would we, what, you know, what channels will we normally use? And I think um, that the global pandemic's given us an opportunity to challenge all of that status quo and to give us the opportunity to, to challenge all of that with our stakeholders as well, um, that there's no longer a normal way of doing things. Um, and in the same way that, um, that the pandemic has accelerated the digitization of the world, because we've had to, I think it's also accelerating change in, in marketing thinking. Um, so I guess, so it's a very long answer to your question, Boone. <laughs> um, but I think if we go back to that question around what my predictions, I think we, we're going to go back to the first principles of marketing now to, to really think about why are we here um, as organisations? Um, what's the positive impact that we're having on the world, on the people that work for us, on the people that we work with? Um, and how do we how how do we bring that to life in in articulating both what what we do and how we help, but also what makes us different? And for me, that all wraps up so beautifully in purpose. Um, I, I think you know nearly every organisation now is really thinking about the positive impact that the organisation can have, um, and and why we're here. Um, and I think that's a fabulous place for for, for marketers to start in twenty twenty one. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I think two things that really came out from, from what you shared. I think the first is how we work with our stakeholders. So, you know, I think at Cisco as well, we've seen with the digitization and the, the quick adaptability that we have to have, right, in the post-COVID world, 
that we have to be so much working, we have to work so much closer with our sales stakeholders and how marketing is playing such a critical critical role in terms of sharing data, but also, uh, you know, more importantly, sharing leads and opportunities. Have you seen some of that happening at NTT as well? Yeah, I mean, definitely. You know, one of the one of the great things about um, you know digitalization as pretty much executing everything in the digital space is that we have more data than we've ever had before about what's happening, um, and also that we can execute so quickly. You know, I think uh, this year we've we've all learned to be even more agile than we were before, haven't we? To 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 do something, to take the data, to take the learning, and to move forward and to get better. Um, I think that's absolutely. Um, I think one of the one of the benefits of of this of, of this year is is that that feedback that much more immediate feedback loop around um, cause effect and impact improvement um, and that cycle. Um, and um, you know certainly all of the work that we do across the digital channels, you know the online forums, our website, uh, our intent platforms allows us to track them. That's that 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 that's so much more than we've ever been able to do before. I think one of the things that I see is sometimes that data can be quite overwhelming, um, and so often I think our role as as marketers is to make sure that we're seeing in in that data and, and what that's showing us and telling us that the behaviour that's behind so much of um, that that tracking and analysis that we see, and ultimately behind that is a human that's doing something and um, that's looking up or trying to solve a problem. And I think connecting that data back to the individual and the help that that individual needs is, is ultimately, I think, what, what, what our responsibility is. Yeah, that's so great. Uh, and it actually links to, links to the second point that I wanted to talk a little bit more about around purpose-driven marketing. You know, at Cisco, you know, we have a long partnership with NTT specifically around connected conservation. But I know that purpose-driven marketing is so important for you personally, but also for NTT. Can you share a little bit more about the latest work that you guys have been working on? So you're right, Boone, and you know this is my personal passion, really, in terms of both the, the connection between an organization and its purpose. And I think, particularly right now, that's that's probably the biggest trend in marketing, isn't it? You know, across all sectors, I'm hearing all, all organizations lean into, or how, how can we help? Make the world better right now. You know, a huge trend around um, organisations finding their soul and also being kind um, to, 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 you know, helping helping the world be be kind to each other. Um, and yes, absolutely. You know, in NTT, together with many of our partners like Cisco, um, we believe in that the power of technology to make a positive impact on the world and to help solve some of the world's biggest problems. So together, we've tackled. Um, animal poaching and quite specifically rhino poaching. You know, we were in danger of losing all of the rhinos in the world by 2025, um, a decade ago, and through many of the projects that are now rolling out across many parts of Africa, we're seeing a, a gradual reversal in, in that poaching trend, which is, which is great to see. Um, but we are um, very lucky, I, I guess, just as we launched our new company last year, um, that the United Nations has actually published a very clear roadmap of uh, the, the major challenges in the world that, that need to be solved in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And behind each of those 17 goals, actually a very clear blueprint of what change needs to happen. Um, so we're adopting um, the support of those 17 Sustainable Development Goals at the very heart of our purpose. And one of the things actually we, we feel very proud to be is a business avenger for one of those goals, which is goal 11 around sustainable life in cities and communities. You know, how can technology um, make all of our lives better in the communities that we live in? And increasingly, as more of us live in urban environments and, and move to the cities, um, life in cities better. And there's all kinds of examples of things that are already happening, um, you know, such as the ability for us to, to, to have smarter travel, to understand the quickest way for us to get across the city, Increasingly now, because of the pandemic, you know, what public transport routes would be quieter, what parts of a train even, I was looking at my app yesterday, would be quieter than others if I'm if I'm using public transport. Um, you know, so so uh, effectiveness, but also safety in, in travel, you know, smart, smart metering, um, smart connectivity, 
obviously the, the the role of IoT in connecting devices across cities, whether it's in our own homes or indeed um, in, in in government infrastructure, you know, technology is already beginning to make a massive difference. Um, and one of the projects that, that we're, we've recently been working on actually with a university partner of ours down in Australia, is beginning to start to think about the role of technology in tackling some of the world's um, most devastating diseases. And actually just earlier on today, we were talking about um, the role of technology in actually helping dementia care um, so many, so many of us are affected, um, sadly, by dementia. Um, you know, one in fourteen adults, uh, sadly, is are, are, um, are, are affected by dementia. But technology can really help in terms of just reminding people of simple tasks that are often forgotten um, in dementia patients, such as you know, cleaning your teeth in the morning, you know, remembering to have lunch, or remembering that you have had lunch. Um, uh, reminding you know your birthdays or, or key events that you need to do just through s simple voice activated prompts um, through smart devices in the home and um, just technology making such a big difference in, in, in people's lives and across the technology industry I know that we have a wealth of projects and a wealth of stories of technology making a positive impact um, in, in many parts of lives around the world. Yeah, that's yeah, so I mean, it's such a critical part of what we do. It's not just, you know, like basically, yeah, it's not just what we do, but but why we do it. And I think that's so critical, right? In terms of, especially in the post COVID world today. So I have um, three lightning round questions, very quick, simple questions. Uh, and I hope you can indulge me on this. Uh, the first one is, what does agile marketing mean to you? Oh, goodness, that's a great question, Boone. Um, I think it's that ability to, to to plan, to execute, to learn, and to cycle back around that. And and particularly now when we are a fully digitized um, marketing exercise, we are we have to be agile. We have to do really quick learning, iterations, um, and then execution. I love that. That's great. Second question: What are you binging on right now? Shoes, uh, books, or shows uh, during the COVID time? What am I binging on? Um, do you know what? I flip flop bit, bit between them. Um, I've, I've had my Netflix binge, as I think we all have. I think that was probably towards the beginning of, of, of COVID for me. And then I realized that probably wasn't too healthy. And then I really started reading a lot just to get away from screens um, um, because I thought it was really important because we spend so much time now in front of our screens. But probably the one thing I've been binging on the most is, is just fresh air. Um, I've loved the opportunity to walk my dog every day. I've loved the opportunity to go for a run three or four times a week. Um, you know, so uh, I know that sounds like a very healthy binge, but I I probably say I've been binging on fresh air. That's great. That, that's very healthy and, and very essential. Um, you know what? I just discovered the Great British Bake Off. I know they probably have like 10 seasons, <laughs> but I've only just started to watch it and it's so relaxing and therapeutic, I have to say. <laughs> it's also so British, Boone. Some of the humour is. It's so British and it's such a British thing. You know, you put a bunch of people from so many different backgrounds in a tent and ask them to bake bread. <laughs> yeah, how, could, how could that possibly be compelling television? But it really is, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but it's also, I mean, they're also really, they're so nice and they're helping each other out. There's no like backstabbing, you know, kind of reality TV stuff. So I, I've been really enjoying that. Um, and then the last question is, uh, what's the first thing you're going to do after this COVID stuff is over? Oh, goodness. Do you know, that's an easy one. I'm going to get on an aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my life before COVID, I was probably traveling every every second week, certainly through the integration project that we did. And and uh, funnily enough, I keep saying to my husband, when you asked me at Christmas, you know, what did I wish for for 2020? And I actually said to him, I want to be traveling less and I want to be at home more. And little did I realize, you know, what was about to happen with the pandemic that that would absolutely come true. Um, but I'm a natural explorer. You know, I'm a curious traveler. Um, I love being in different places and the opportunity to meet different people. And I miss, I, I actually miss uh, not so much airports and airplanes, but but I do miss being in different places with different people. Um, so that will be my first thing. I'll, I'll find a passport wherever it is um, yeah, and, it is. And, and come visit you. I agree. I mean, that's such a difficult life, addictive lifestyle, right? When you're being, you're, you're able to transport to, you know, different parts of the world, meeting different people, learning about different cultures we talked about earlier. 
Um, the one thing I miss about traveling, and I miss traveling a lot as well, is the downtime you get on airplanes. Maybe not now when you have to kind of breathe through a, a, a mask and, and take all this precaution, but just having the downtime away, at least in my case, from the kids, and just be able to think and just process and just kind of meditate a little bit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But what's great is oh, we now know that we, we now see the benefit of being on an airplane as meditation. Yeah, that's true. So Ruth, that's all the questions I have for you today. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us.